the topic that Daniel asked me to talk about was uh, managing and minimizing environmental mastitis. So that, that's going to be the topic this morning. If you've got questions, I can hear you fine. So, so one of the things that is different about environmental mastitis as compared to the kind of traditional contagious mastitis is that environmental mastitis can occur in herds that don't apparently have what we consider to be a traditional mastitis problem. So you can have a very significant environmental mastitis problem in a herd that has a very low bulk tank somatic cell count. So I'm gonna to try to do something here just for fun. I'm gonna to try to underline that. Okay, this is just, I'm experimenting with the technology here. Uh, so we can have um, herds that, that don't have an apparent mastitis problem because they're shipping very low bulk, uh, very good bulk tank somatic cell count milk, but yet they have a very serious mastitis problem. And the data that I'm showing in this screen is data we collected a couple of years ago from 51 large Wisconsin dairy herds. Now, you know, we have about 10,000 dairy herds in Wisconsin. Um, about 500 of them have more than 200 cows, and this is from that population. But uh, uh, the, the smaller, most of the smaller herds actually would have very similar data. It's just harder to collect data from smaller herds. So in this particular population, the average bulk tank somatic cell count was 209,000 cells per mil which you know, we'd normally consider that to be pretty good milk. Um, today, uh, you know, we're shooting for less than 250. The, on average, these herds make that. Uh, these herds had controlled Staph aureus. So we had only 3% of the clinical cases that were enrolled in this study were actually caused by Staph aureus. They had no strep ag. You know, if you look on the surface, these herds really seem to have done a great job of controlling mastitis. And to a certain extent, they had. But this graph that I'm showing on the side here also demonstrates kind of what we see now that is one of the issues we get into. And this is the proportion of cows that were treated for clinical mastitis on these herds. So on this vertical axis, this is the number of farms. On the horizontal axis, that's the percentage of cows treated. And in this population overall, there were 39 cases of clinical mastitis treated per 100 cows per year. And uh, that's very typical of what we see in other studies when we look at clinical mastitis on modern dairies. But the interesting thing is, to me, is the range. We had three herds that treated 0 to 10 cases of clinical mastitis per 100 cows, and we had the same number of herds that treated virtually all of the cows for clinical mastitis. So when you look across this data, um, it's pretty evident that mastitis, the presentation of mastitis has changed. And this is the type of data that is very typical for um, what we consider to have be a um, environmental mastitis problem. I gotta see if I can make this advance. Here we go. And it looks like I have to erase. Oh, I, I kind of thought that might happen. I noticed this too. You have to, um, you go up to that, Banner, yeah, just undo yeah. that works. Yeah, okay. Okay, I got that. So when we went into these farms, these 51 farms, the way we did this study was um, we were just interested in finding out how mastitis, what was causing mastitis and how it was being treated. So we went to these 51 farms and we just asked them, enroll the next 15 cases of clinical mastitis that occur on your dairy farm. And we had some criteria, take some sterile milk samples for us, submit them to our laboratory. And so we found out what was causing the mastitis. And that's what's shown in this slide. The, the, most of the cases of clinical mastitis on these dairies were caused by opportunistic environmental bacteria. In fact, the most common cause of the clinical mastitis or the most common result of the milk samples was no growth. Now, normally, if, if we were in the same room, I would ask you, you know, how many of you have ever submitted a milk sample from a clinical case of mastitis and gotten the result of no growth? We have, have you submitted one? All right, we have one. 
<laughs> yeah, do you like that result? Oh, I love it. <laughs> and well, it's actually a really good result. To tell you the truth, that, that I have whole, whole, whole lectures just about that subject. But no growth in a clinical case typically is a really good sign. It doesn't mean that the laboratory is bad. It doesn't mean that you're missing the pathogen. In a clinical case, it typically means that those clinical symptoms of the mastitis you see, that inflammation, which is a result of the cow's immune response, has actually successfully eliminated the bacteria. Now that's not the same for subclinical mastitis, um, but that's another story. Uh, so, so the most common outcome was, was no growth. The second most common is E. coli. The third most common are environmental streps, and then we have Klebsiella. And it's not till we get way down the road to these uh, um, uh, staph that we see Staph aureus, or these traditional causes of more contagious mastitis. And so really what we've found is today, mainly as a result of, of people adopting good management practices, the most common cause of mastitis on our dairy farms is really environmental pathogens. And um, so controlling environmental pathogens means we have to do things a little different. So um, what I'm gonna do in the, about the next 40 minutes that I have here today is really talk about the changing concepts of how mastitis occurs, presents, why it presents like this on, on modern dairy farms, and talk about some practical ways that we have to change our management to actually reduce the amount of environmental mastitis. So whenever I start a talk, I always like to um, start with a really, really basic concept of of really what, what mastitis is. Mastitis is an incredibly simple disease. Okay, I can see you guys, so raise your hand if you agree with that. <laughs> All right, well, come on. It is really a simple disease. Um, you know, it, it's a bacterial infection of the udder. That's what causes it, it's bacteria. 99% of the time it occurs when bacterial exposure at the teat end exceeds the ability of the immune defenses of the cow. And so we know what causes it, it's what? Bacteria, right? We know how they get infected, it's when bacteria, like in this picture, come in contact with the teats. So let me ask you, how do we prevent it? Yes. Yes. Well, we keep bacteria away from teats, right? So is that a simple disease or what? Should be. Yeah, it should be. That, that sounds really simple, but you know, God designed the udder incorrectly, put it on the bottom of the cow, and that makes that control actually much more difficult than it sounds for me sitting here in my office in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, so, but it is basically, it's a bacterial disease that occurs when teats come in contact with bacteria. After those bacteria get into the udder, they, they behave just like any bacterial infection, including bacterial infections that you and I get. The bacteria get in, there's a brief period where we don't know we're infected, so that it, during that period, the bacteria are multiplying, 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 but we don't know the cow's infected. And at some point, there's enough bacteria that the cow's immune system recognizes that infection and responds. And it's that immune response that, that's the disease we call mastitis. We recognize mastitis on the basis of the inflammation caused by the immune response to bacterial infection. And there's really two ways we recognize it. One is subclinical mastitis, and that's when the milk appears normal, but it contains too many inflammatory cells. Those inflammatory cells are the white blood cells that normally are in the bloodstream of the cow, and they get called by the immune defenses of the cow to the udder to fight bacteria. So we measure those by, by monitoring the cow's somatic cell count. That's what subclinical mastitis is. It's just the inflammation. Clinical mastitis is also a result of inflammation. It's um, a different stage of the same bacterial infection, but we just define it that we have visual abnormalities of milk. And this disease 
is the more this this presentation of the disease is the more frequent presentation on many farms of environmental mastitis. I was on a farm here in Wisconsin, a very big farm, on Tuesday that had thousands of cases of clinical mastitis last year. And 65% of those cases are culture negative. They culture all of them, 65%. And they're detecting, their detection system is excellent. They've got the really well-trained people, but they had I think so over, I, I can't tell you how many thousands of cases last year, they do have several thousand cows, but, but the important thing to recognize is on many farms today, that definition is gonna be different. We recommend that every farm measures what we call the incidence of clinical mastitis, and that is the number of first cases. So here's an important take home note. When, we, when I go to farms and ask people about how much mastitis do you have, farmers typically will tell me how many cows they treated, or if they're a bigger dairy, they'll tell me how many cows are in the hospital pen today. And that measures all the cases of clinical mastitis. The, the first cases, the second cases, and the third cases. And I'm gonna show you in a minute, you have to measure the first cases separately, and that should be your number one indicator of is your control program working? Because once, uh, because the first case of mastitis is an indicator of exposure. So that's important. There's a couple other things I'm gonna use today that I'm gonna talk about as monitors of mastitis. One is the percent of cows with milk discarded, and the other one is the percent of cows milking with less than four quarters. The percent of cows with milk discarded measures the amount of current loss of milk, it's an economic indicator, and the percent of cows milking in less than four quarters measures chronicity. So why am I focusing on these things? Because clinical mastitis is not well recorded on at least 50% of the dairies that we go to today. That's regardless of herd size. So if we're looking at controlling environmental mastitis, the first step is, are we measuring it and defining it properly? So let's move on. Here's a couple of pictures. Um, that uh, help us really define how we um, characterize mastitis. And I brought up the terms contagious mastitis and environmental mastitis. So how many of you have heard those terms before? Environmental or contagious mastitis. Yeah, most of, most of us have. And these pictures are, are all you really need to remember to, to understand how contagious or environmental mastitis works. And by the way, these terms are not mutually exclusive. You can have an environmental mastitis pathogen that gets transmitted in a contagious manner. So let's start with the contagious. That's the, take a look at the udder I've got there with the terrible teat dipping. Um, contagious mastitis simply means that these bacteria are transmitted among cows when the teats of healthy cows are exposed to bacteria that originate in an infected udder. So for example, if you take a look at this light quarter right here. Okay, this is probably a chronically infected quarter. It's still milking. The milk from this chronic subclinical infection will contain bacteria. Those droplets of milk will get in the liners when you attach the teat cup. When you take this teat cup off of her and put it on the next cow, you're exposing that cow. That's basically contagious mastitis. And any, any, of, any subclinical mastitis pathogen can be transmitted in a contagious manner. So that includes things like Klebsiella. However, most contagious mastitis is gram positive. That means it's like staphs and streps. And almost always contagious pathogens have a long subclinical phase. So that's contagious mastitis. Environmental mastitis in general is represented by this photo that's on your uh, right. What do you notice about this photo? You notice 
anything this is let me just tell you where this is this is the dry cow housing on a large dairy that i was at what do you think about that Some yeah and you know take a look right here it's a terrible terrible sign when you've got a perfect reflection of a cow in the dry cow area that she's living in. Environmental mastitis basically means that what you've got are teats that are exposed to bacteria that originate in the housing of the cow. It could be the, the lot outside, it could be the woods, it could be this terrible wet environment. And these pathogens are often opportunistic, meaning they don't have to adapt to live in the udder of the cow. They often have short duration infections. They often stimulate a fairly large immune response in the cow that successfully kills the bacteria, which is why we see all these culture negative samples and they're often clinical. The tricky thing is many of these cows that develop these environmental and mastitis infections, some of these bacteria can become subclinical and then be transmitted in a contagious manner. So um, these things are not entirely black and white. Now, when we look at clinical mastitis on dairy farms um, today on, uh, in Wisconsin, here's what we find. And this would be similar also in Canada, which would have probably a little bit more similar herd structure than this population here in Wisconsin, but they're not too different. So when we look at clinical mastitis, you'll see about 30% is no growth. About 40% is typically uh, coliforms. And then these blue ones up here, these are streps and staphs. The red one is staph aureus. And then we've got a whole bunch of other ones. The, the, the take home point is, you'll see this is the same actually in modern herds in the United Kingdom, in Holland, in Germany, New Zealand. You see a little bit more Staph aureus. And with smaller herds in our region, we see a little bit more Staph aureus as well. This Staph aureus will just about double in our smaller herds, close to double. But in general, these pathogens are pathogens that we're exposing the cows to in their environment because of inadequate management of housing facilities. So when we look at controlling environmental mastitis, we're looking at controlling exposure. And it's pretty important to recognize that when we look at controlling exposure, I gotta get rid of this one. It doesn't let me advance unless I erase everything. Okay. When we look at controlling exposure, one important thing to recognize that it's uh, something we can do on our dairy farms about environmental mastitis is not all cows are at equal risk. Take a look at this picture. I took this picture actually in South America on a, um, in Argentina on a large dairy farm. Well, mid-sized dairy farm. This is about all their lactating cows. Look at the exposure here. Would you say this is a high risk or a low risk environment for mastitis it's wet there's a lot of moisture mud manure but yet not all the cows have clinical mastitis or, or subclinical mastitis right and if you think about your own herds I'm sure you could say the same thing you could put two cows in the same environment and both of them don't have the same risk of infection and that's because cows are constantly, the teats of cows are constantly exposed to bacteria. And in a healthy cow in positive energy balance with good teat condition, um, most of the time the cow's immune system will be successful at fighting off those infections. So the cows that are at greatest risk and the cows that require the most attention to prevent environmental mastitis are the cows that are in earlier lactation. And this is a slide again of these 51 Wisconsin dairy herds. Let me tell you what you're looking at here. On the horizontal axis, that's the number of days in milk the cows were when they got mastitis. The vertical axis is the um, 
frequency, and you'll see that out of all these 643 cases, about 55 of them, or about 10% of them, occurred in the first seven days post-calving. And you'll see the frequency overall is a little bit higher in early lactation than when you start getting into later lactation. And this is because cows in early lactation are immune suppressed. They're often a negative energy balance and the same exposure to mastitis pathogens, if you are exposing them to, to a million colony forming units in bedding in the first week versus a million colony forming units in the bedding in the 20th week, you're gonna have different rates of infection. So this is an important take home message when we're looking at controlling environmental mastitis, we've got to look at each farm. Oops, somehow I have lost. What do you guys see? You. you. Okay. So I am, I can't see my slide anymore. Oh, there we, now I'm seeing just you. Okay. Um, so go, do, all right. Can you go down to share screen again? Yeah, let me go to that. No, I'm good. Can you see my slides? Nope, just see you. Oh, okay. So here we are. How's that? Uh, okay, we'll get this down. Are you seeing my slide now? We see a black screen that says Pam has started. There we go. You're back on. You're back on. Okay. okay. So if you take a look at this slide, the key thing to, to recognize is that on each farm, you could, should be able to look at your cattle, your housing environment, and identify the animals that are at highest risk. The animals that you think have the least ability to, to resist mastitis. And I'll tell you um, some of the characteristics of that are, would be negative energy balance, leaky teats, older cows versus younger cows. We have a study that we're just finishing right now that shows that cows that have wider teat apexes, that's the very end of the teat, the teat end, have a, about a 20% increased risk of clinical mastitis. That's probably because their teeth sphincters don't close as rapidly. So, so when you look at those things, those are the animals that you have to be sure that you provide the best environment for. And those are the animals that you really want to prevent the first case. So here's the, a, another important take home when we look at environmental mastitis. We don't want to really focus on treatment as our salvation, salvation for mastitis. What we wanna focus on is prevention, and we wanna focus on prevention of the first clinical case. This is some work that we did a few years ago in our own herd here at UW. We, we milk uh, about 600 cows in a couple of facilities, um, and this was done on our 400 cow dairy. In this particular study, we had um, a couple hundred cows, 813 quarters, that we monitored. And what we did is we looked at, did these cows have a clinical case in their last lactation? Or did these quarters? So we had 813 quarters from a couple hundred cows. And of those 813 quarters, 78 of them had had a clinical case in the previous lactation. And of those 78 quarters, 23% of them had a case in the current lactation which is a lot. And it's especially a lot when you look at, we had 735 quarters from those same cows that didn't have a clinical in the previous lactation. And those quarters, only 6% of them had a clinical case in the current lactation. So the take home on that is, once a cow gets a case, we increase their risk of future cases. And cows that have a case of mastitis are five times more likely to have future cases. That's even in the next lactation, even if the quarter's culture negative, and even if the quarter doesn't have a chronically high cell count. So there's something about the development of a that first case that, that increases their risk of future cases. So we've got to find the cows that are most susceptible to environmental mastitis. We've got to find the quarters, and then we've got to look at preventing and minimizing the risks. So one of the first points that we want to do go ahead. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Can you can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. My first question is when you're talking about recurrence, 
uh, you're talking only about yes. mastitis. You don't care about the pathogen. You're not talking about a recurrence of a specific infection, infectious pathogen. You're not talking about a recurrence of a strep species mastitis or a recurrence of a staph aureus. You're just talking about clinical recurrence. Is that right? I, I am, but, but uh, that's a great question, by the way, um, because actually when we look at monitoring recurrence, it, it does vary by pathogens to a certain extent. So that, that's a great question. Okay, and then my second question is, you're saying that it's the, that once they get the clinical mastitis, they're five times more likely to recur. And I'm sort of hearing you say it's that first case of clinical mastitis that's causing the recurrence. But it, one could certainly also say that that particular animal is just initially more susceptible. How, where's the causality coming in here? It could be either way. That, that is also a great point. So, so in fact, I just was having this discussion on this big farm I was at on Tuesday. They have a really high recurrence rate. They have a 50% recurrence rate on that particular farm. It, which is outrageously high. 20% is a normal recurrence rate for dairies. We've monitored uh, 40 or 50 dairies on this it, within about a 60 day window. And we're not sure, we can't tell most of the time if the recurrence is because of the pathogen or the cow. And I think in many instances, it's actually because of the cow. But I don't know if even at the cow, the recurrence of the same pathogen is always the same case. And it varies between gram negative and gram positive. We looked at recurrences of E. coli at the quarter level um, and found that even when we looked at recurrent E. coli, if we did the DNA fingerprints on them, they're almost all different. So, the vast majority we had, I think, in fact, that's the slide I just skipped over. I think it was 53 different strains from 58 different cases of mastitis, including recurrences. They were just all different. And other people have reported this as well. We also have looked at streps. And with streps, we get a much higher degree of the same bacteria, the same strain. But we're not even sure then if those are persistent infections not cured or if they're just reinfections with the same strain of a bacteria that likes to cause mastitis. You follow me? Yes. That may be the most prevalent strain of mastitis causing organism in the environment. So we're not sure on the answers of those. I will tell you that at the cow level versus the quarter level, if you have a 20% cow level recurrence rate, usually about half of that is the same quarter and half of that is different quarters. And we've looked at that at a number of farms as well. So I think there's both cow and pathogen related risks, but I don't understand it completely. And then one, one, Does that answer at all? Yes, that's all, all very interesting and relevant. And one, one quick final question that I hope at some point We'll give a tiny bit of discussion to lactococcus when you got to talking about recurring stress. So when, whenever we're uh, we've looked at lactococcus extensively. Lactococcus behaves very similar to strep uberus. And that makes sense because for years we called it strep uberus, right? And um, we've actually done pulse field gel electrophoresis, DNA fingerprints on lactococcus as well. Um, it really doesn't behave much differently. It has a slightly longer subclinical phase before it goes clinical. In the data we've looked at, we looked at 43 cases of it. Um, but uh, it really would be very difficult to differentiate it from, from any strep behavior. We've also done um, mammary cell invasion in our laboratory of uh, with strep uberus and strep dyscalactia and lactococcus and, and staph aureus, and it behaves it, it, very similarly to the streps. It's not very invasive. And, and you're not finding it to so, be more chronic and it's, uh, and, it's, and it's hanging on versus the streps. Q, QMPS is saying that they're, 
thinking of some of the uh, things that they've been historically calling strepulous, but they have been quite chronic that they're now differentiating as lactic and, and that seems to me to make sense of what I've seen historically. Yeah, I, I think I think some of them are lactococcus, but I don't think all persistent streps are lactococcus. Uh, in in the isolates we've looked at, um, the 43 isolates that we looked at and compared to streps over time, they had just the same variation as streps do. So uh, I'm not as convinced. I've seen the QMPS stuff, but I, I'm not as convinced that we're seeing the same trends here. Thank you. Yep. All right, so good discussion. Um, you know, it comes right into my point on we have to define, detect, monitor clinical mastitis. We recommend people monitor the severity scores and use a consistent severity scoring system because that'll tell you if you're finding the cases. This is especially true if um, you're not milking your own cows, if somebody's milking the cows and you're not sure what their definition of mastitis is. So we recommend a very simple severity scoring system. Severity score one is mild, abnormal milk only. Severity score two, moderate. Abnormal milk, abnormal udder. And severity score three, severe cases. It goes beyond the udder. Um, I've got a link here uh, on this PowerPoint. You can see on my YouTube channel, we've got a video on how to assess severity scores. And um, in general, this little graph shows you about 50% of all clinical mastitis, regardless of pathogen, is mild, abnormal milk only. About 35% is moderate, and a minority, 5 to 15%, are severe cases. And so the way we use this on farms is if I go to a farm and I say, well, how much mastitis have you had? And they say, well, I've had uh, 10 cases. Well, how many of the what, cases were um, severe? Oh, eight of them. They were, were sick. Well, that tells you they're missing the moderates and the miles. So it's a good way to monitor and, and assess the detection efficiency. So I, I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but I do wanna mention that um, we wanna make sure that we're monitoring incidents. That's the, that first clinical case rate. I just put this slide here, really, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it because I wanna get into managing the environment but it does give you how to calculate and some goals for key performance indicators. So the incidence rate is the number of first cases in that lactation divided by the average number of cows, and our goal is less than 25 cases per 100 cows per year. I will see if I can turn off. I think we're gonna have to let that go. I don't know how to make my phone stop ringing. So it shouldn't go long. Okay, second uh, point in minimizing environmental mastitis. Remember, we were talking about differences in susceptibility. Well, that means we really need to manage the dry and the fresh cows. And uh, so these are really critical. And it's not just the dry cows. That transition period is a really critical period for minimizing environmental mastitis. This is some old data from Holland. Herman Barkema's work is part of his PhD in the late 90s but it's really relevant. When you take a look at this data, what you'll see is we've got uh, herds that have very high quality milk versus herds that have um, not as high quality milk. And we're looking at management of the dry, dry cows. So if you look at the percent of cows with udders below the hocks, it's much higher on the herds that have poorer bulk tank somatic cell counts more subclinical mastitis. If we look at the percent of dirty udders, and we've shown this data as well, it's four times higher. Even though it's low, it's four times higher in the herds with poorer bulk tank cell count. Use of dry cow therapy in every quarter of every cow. This is a new issue now. People are talking about uh, selective therapy, but in this study, the herds with low bulk tank somatic cell count uh, almost all of them use dry cow therapy every quarter of every cow versus only um, about three quarters of the herds with lower, with higher bulk tank cell counts. And then things like looking at the dry cows for mastitis or importantly, managing 
the calving pen environment. So this was 84% uh, of these really high quality herds removed the straw from the calving pen after every calving versus about 50%. And there's other studies as well. I, I used this one because it's got a bunch of them here that, um, that, that are, have been validated by other studies that really demonstrate that the hygiene and the anatomic characteristics of the dry cows can have a big influence on the development of environmental mastitis. And uh, that's been apparent in many studies since this time. So when we look at minimizing the amount of environmental mastitis, one of the most important things we can do is make sure we su supply sufficient area for those cows and the minimum required area is 100 square feet per cow of dry lying space. Let me repeat that. So that's just 100 square feet per cow. It's 100 square feet per cow of dry lying space. This is a photo from a farm I was at that was, at, this was actually in Europe, where they brought me over here to look at these animals because we were looking at their somatic cell count data and 40 or 45 percent of the animals at their first test had a high somatic cell count. So I said, hey, let's go look, look, look at the dry cows and this is what we found, way too overcrowded. Now take a look at this photo. This is a dry cow in springing heifer area on a dairy farm. What do you guys think of this? Does it meet our requirement? The slide didn't change. Did you, did you change slides? Oh, there we go. Okay, we're good. Wow. No. Yeah, so this is a farm here in Wisconsin. And uh, the thing I want to point out is that there, if you went in here and just measured it, you would come up with approximately, you'd say, well, there's approximately twice as much dry light or, or available space as it really is. You have to identify the dry lying space, not just all the area that's there. That's a really important thing. So you can measure pens and get a very, very incorrect assessment of what's actually there. And what happens is, this is a heifer, you'll see the heifers are the ones you know, that are less dominant and you end up with the heifers down here and animals either stand around because they don't want to lay down in this wet area so they don't get sufficient rest or you get your less dominant animals, which really end up getting exposed to these wet, met, wet and muddy areas. So this is a really important thing to recognize is you have to look at where is the actual effective dry lying space, not just the, the, si the pen size. And here's what I recommend. This is a photo again here in Wisconsin on a mid-sized farm um, that had built a new freestyle barn for their lactating herd. And the ultimate test is go into your calving area. You'll see, you can see these are springing. They're gonna be calving down here. There's been some straw scattered around. But the ultimate test is lay down and roll around in it. If you're not comfortable laying down and rolling around in the calving pen, it's not sufficient for calving. So that's the ultimate test. And uh, uh, it needs to be dry enough that we're comfortable laying down in it. Another thing to think about is after those cows calve, typically regardless of herd size, all of the fresh cows are milked with special milking units um, so that we can discard the milk or use the colostrum, right? And uh, these separate milking units are often very neglected. And I have found these to be an, a massive risk factor for um, spread of mastitis to fresh cows, both contagious and environmental mastitis um, in many herds. So we have to ensure that the fresh cows are milked with clean, well-operating milking equipment uh, that's well-maintained. So those are a couple of uh, things that we need to do in the prevention side, but one of the really big areas that we need to continue to work on is managing bedding. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've got a real variety of bedding sources. In Wisconsin, the number one bedding type used is sand. 
uh, and in fact, it's clean. So we've got sand, we've got mattresses, we've got very little straw that's used, um, but we do get some straw. We've got a variety of wood products, shavings, sawdust, etc. But managing bedding is an enormous issue relative to controlling environmental mastitis. This is uh, um, four different bedding types. Uh, this is, they don't, the photos aren't all taken with the same light, so it looks a little bit strange, but this is uh, clean sand. This is recycled sand. This is deep bedded manure solids. We have only have a minority of farms that use this. They're all bigger farms. And then we've got mattresses. And these mattress, this particular pen and this mattress then has some bedding on top of it with um, manure solids. But we often, the most common bedding for a mattress is uh, wood products. So one of the things we know is that exposure to bacteria in bedding is directly related to the amount of mastitis we see on farms. And that exposure is much more important and much more significant for organic bedding types. And the primary issue with the organic bedding types is the moisture content. So, you know, it's very common for sand to be at least 90% dry, especially on the surface. And it's very common for organic bedding types to be somewhere between 30 and 50% dry. And that moisture really drives bacterial growth. And when we look at bacterial growth, the rate of clinical mastitis on farms is associated with the number of bacteria we see in the bedding. This is a really old study by Joe Hogan, but it's, um, it, it really illustrates the point really well. In this study, they went to, I think it was 13 different farms, and they collected bedding samples. And then they measured the amount of bacteria in the bedding. They also collected from farms the amount of clinical mastitis cases per lactation. So each of these dots is one farm. And for, so for example, this farm had about uh, 10 cases of clinical mastitis per 100 cows per year. You could equate that to. This farm had about 80 cases of clinical mastitis per 100 cows per year. And then this is the amount of Klebsiella in their bedding. And this is a log scale. This is 10 to the second. This is 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, and 10 to the sixth. Now, if you're like me, I'm a veterinarian and I, you know, I'm not great at math. And so looking at these log scales can be confusing for me. And 10 to the second is what? 10 times 10, which is how many colony forming units of bacteria? 100, right. 10 to the third is what? 1,000. 10 to the fourth is 10,000. 10 to the fifth is 100,000. 10 to the sixth is a million. When we look at bedding, a lot of times people say, well, we want to be less than a million up here. What I want you to see is that this relationship between the amount of bacteria in the bedding and the amount of mastitis is linear. As you go from 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3, you get more. As you go from 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, you get more. As you go from 10 to the 4, et cetera. All exposure increases on average the amount of mastitis. That's one point I want you to notice. The second point I want you to notice, that doesn't apply to all herds. You've got herds that have high amounts of bacteria, like this one. So 10 to the fifth, but very, very low amounts of mastitis. You also have herds that have lower amounts of bacteria and a lot of mastitis. So, you know, the, the key really is, yes, there's a linear relationship, but it's clear there's also management things that can be done on those farms to control that relationship between exposure and mastitis. Okay. What, what are some of those and one of the most important things, go ahead. What are some of those factors? Is that, again, back to the energy balance and things like that, or just? I'm gonna show you some right now. Probably the most important one some of them will go back to the anatomy of the cows that you happen to have on your farm. If you have older cows, you have to provide lower exposure because their teat ends are wider and have less ability to resist infection. But a big factor is moisture, moisture in that bedding. 
That's got to be one of the most important things we try to control. And I'm going to show you just a couple of slides on that. This is uh, uh, data that was given to me by Nina von Kaiserlink from the University of British Columbia. They did a study, and you can see it in this, um, in this slide, where they had stalls where they had either wet bedding, you can see this is darker, or dry bedding. And every other stall was re either wet or dry. First thing they looked at, it's not as relevant for what we're interested in, but the first thing they looked at was uh, lying time. And that's what's in this graph. Cows that had access to dry bedding, and this was in a different experiment, slept more, laid down more, than cows that were exposed to wet bedding. And let me show you this next slide that really illustrates why moisture is important, re reducing moisture is important. Now hopefully you'll be able to see this. This is video and we didn't test the video. Can you see the video? Yeah. Okay, so this is that same pens. Every other stall is wet bedding. It's the same bedding and then the these pens, every other stall has dry. This cow has just entered. She's looking for a place to lie down. She goes to the first stall, it was wet, she won't lie down. She goes to the second stall, it's wet, she won't lie down. She goes back and checks the wet stall, it's still wet, she won't lie down. She tries to move the cow from the dry bedding. That one's wet, then she finds a stall with the dry bedding and lies down. A really dramatic indication of, of, of the impact that the choices we have uh, that we make on the farm um, can have on, uh, on uh, oops, I gotta go back here. Somehow I lost my slides again. There we are, I think we're good. And we really need to be thinking about controlling this, um, the bedding on our farms. Now I'm gonna just spend uh, two or three minutes and finish up here uh, showing you just two or three slides, again, uh, from a study we just completed of bedding practices on our large Wisconsin farms. Um, just to tell you that these, these, uh, uh, this data is just about to be, some of it's published and some's not. This study was done on 325 large farms. Uh, they produced about 81 pounds of milk. They had between about 250 and 8,100 cows. And here's the bedding types that they had. Uh, most, 195 of them, had new sand or recycled sand. 62 of them had mattresses with wood products, that's the organic group, and 29 had manure bedding, which I won't spend much time on today. These were really good herds. And one of the things we found was that the exposure to the bedding had an enormous influence on utter health and productivity. This paper has been published in Journal of Dairy Science. I'm just contrasting two of them here that are the most extreme. If you look at sand bedding, we had 195 herds using sand. If you look at manure-based bedding, we had 90, 29 herds using manure-based bedding. They were all in free stalls. First thing I want to point out is the bulk tank somatic cell count. That's this blue line. You can see that the bulk tank somatic cell count of both herds is really acceptable, under 250 for both. But it's 50,000 less for the herds on sand than it is for the herds with manure, indicating there's more subclinical mastitis. Then look at these red bars. This is the percentage of the cows that have discarded milk, indicating which cows are being treated for mastitis. And you can see that the herds on sand have less cows treated. And then the green bars is the percent of the cows in these herds that are milking with less than four quarters, dried off teats. And this is an enormous difference. It goes from about four and a half percent to almost six and a half percent indicating more chronic mastitis for these herds that have manure. Again, indicating the impact of environmental mastitis on utter health. And when we compared the productivity of these herds, 
the large Wisconsin herds that use manure-based bedding, our most extreme bedding type relative to environmental exposure, they produce 2,541 pounds less milk per cow per year than herds using sand. Enormous impact on productivity and utter health. All right, um, uh, I might just end there. And if questions come up, I might uh, come back to some of these slides about management of some of these bedding types. But let me conclude here so we have a few minutes for questions. Today on most of our modern dairy farms, we've done a great job of adopting best management practices that have reduced the amount of staph or is an eradicated strep ag. Today, we're dealing primarily with environmental pathogens and we have to adapt both our monitoring systems so we can find and record the clinical mastitis and then adapt our housing systems so that we can reduce exposure. And control of environmental mastitis is dependent on the ability to minimize exposure of the most susceptible cows. So on your own farm, look at those transition cows, look at those negative energy balance cows, look at the cows with the big teats, look at the older cows, and those cows need to be exposed to high quality bedding that has low amounts of bacteria. One thing I didn't show you, um, but on all the bedding types we've evaluated, including fresh sand, after the sand's in the stalls, there's lots of streptococci in that sand. And everything that's in the sand, we can find in the teats. When we go to a um, more organic bedding types, such as manure, we still have a lot of streptococci, but we also have a lot of gram-negative bacteria. So um, our bedding type does slightly alter the type of bacteria that the teats are exposed to, but all types have lots of strep. So um, the key is keep the cow teats clean and reduce exposure to bacteria in cow housing areas. So nothing simple there, even though the disease itself is quite simple. So with that, I'll just, uh, let me show you a couple of resources we have. Some of the data I have here was part of a, um, Rob Raubotham, one of my PhD students, dissertation, and you can find his papers in Journal of Dairy Science. If you want more information, I've got my website, milkquality.wisc.edu. If you just Google UW Milk Quality, right now, this is the front page. We're featuring um, an on-farm culturing series. Uh, we've got clinical mastitis treatment protocols all defined there. And you're very welcome to visit our YouTube channel. Um, we've had uh, more than 55,000 views of our videos about various types of mastitis control scenarios. So with that, um, can I answer some questions? <clears throat> At what age does a, a heifer start becoming acceptable to mastitis or clinical or subclinical mastitis? So you mean a pre-milking heifer? Yes. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and it varies a little bit depending on the type of mastitis you've got on your farm. Like if you've got a farm where you've got Staph aureus and you're feeding, say, that waste milk to without pasteurizing it to your baby calves, you are increasing the risk of that heifer calving with Staph aureus. And so with, with Staph aureus, we know you can increase the risk. And you know, it's not that um, you feed them that milk and it goes into the, their digestive tract and somehow ends up infecting the udder. That's not how it works. What probably happens is when you feed baby calves milk containing Staph aureus, especially staphs, um, you, they colonize their mouths and when they lick themselves, they colonize their skin. And when they colonize their skin, then you've got more of them everywhere and you just increase the probability that at some point, those bacteria will make it to the teat sphincter. So, that, so, that's, so with Staph aureus, even at babyhood, you can increase the risk. But in general, any time as you get through, when that udder starts blooming, when you start getting them building those udders, increased 
moisture, mud, and manure increase the risk of mastitis after they calf. I have a whole talk on that. It's actually pretty interesting to look at cell counts of healthy and unhealthy heifers um, early on because calving a heifer with, with subclinical mastitis is a really bad way to start. It has a lot of long-term negative implications. So, so to kind of sum up what I just said, babyhood, feeding them infected milk is one risk factor. And then you probably can relax a little bit during that period where they're not bred and their udders really aren't developing, but once that udder starts developing, and it, especially as they move towards springing, um, you really have to look at making sure they're in a clean and dry environment. Thank you. Yep. I had a question about the dry treatment. You kind of touched on it briefly, but yeah, I, I've kind of felt like if the cow, like you're saying, the cows that have an incidence of mastitis, if you, you might be more apt to treat them with dry treatment, but it doesn't seem to help with those ones um, that much in lowering it the next time. At least, I mean, I don't have any statistics for my own herd on it, but it just seems like being selective about it doesn't necessarily help with the ones that you'd really want it to help. Selective dry cow treatment's a really tricky thing to implement well. There's, there's, I, have, I have a whole talk on that itself. There are three really good research papers that have come out on that. One of them was done in Holland where um, they went into herds. They were told they had to stop using dry cow treatment unless they could recover a pathogen. So they just had to start selective dry cow treatment because of their federal regulations. And so they started doing selective dry cow treatment just randomly, every herd. And they selected based on cell counts of the cows, et cetera. And in that scenario, the cell counts and the amount of clinical mastitis went up. So the use of selective dry cow therapy randomly applied to herds is a bad idea. There was another study done in Prince Edward Island um, not too far from you guys. I actually used to work in Prince Edward Island. I lived up there three years. Um, so I lived north of you guys. Um, but uh, that study, they were really, really selective. They used selective dry cow therapy only in circumstances where they could basically prove the cows weren't infected. And in all of these studies, they used Orbacil as a, uh, as a tool to prevent new infections. And in the, in the Prince Edward Island study, they had great results in those herds. Now, I think your question is, if you've got a chronically infected cow and you give dry cow therapy, does she cure? Is that kind of the, the question? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, if, if you were and, or more like, does it, does it work to selectively target high cell count cows with dry cow. Yeah. Okay. So there's two purposes of dry cow therapy. One is to treat the cows that are subclinically infected at the end of lactation. And, um, and, and the second is to prevent the development of new infections during the period before the cows form the keratin plug. And when you go to a selective dry cow program, normally what people do is they try to find the subclinically infected quarters and still use dry cow therapy on those. So you're still trying to treat subclinically infected quarters. Um, and then the prevention aspect, people use teat sealants for in general. Well, there's a couple of issues there. A, chronically infected quarters are very, very difficult to cure. <laughs> so. So depending on the pathogen, depending on the cow, uh, you're correct. Some quarters will never cure. However, the use of dry cow therapy, um, there's plenty of research that shows that for cows, um, in general, the use of blanket dry cow therapy does result in a high rate of cure and a reduction of mastitis in the next lactations. But it doesn't cure all the quarters. 
So the problem with using selective dry cell therapy selectively is we're probably use, using it on the worst possible quarters because we don't have a good test to find out who's really going to respond to it. And when we really target it, there's going to be some quarters that would respond that we'll miss. Second thing is I have real concern about the use of Orbacil without the use of an antibiotic because um, you have to be really, really hygienic when you put something in those teats. And if you put Orbacil in there without an antibiotic, that's pretty risky. So um, I think we've we've only got some herds that have the capability to do a great job like that. I've personally administered Orbacil on cold days here in Wisconsin um, and not enjoyed it at all. Um, so yeah, it kind of answers your question. My answer to your question kind of is, yeah, I agree with you, but, but more to come on the selective dry cow therapy issue.